September 1943, a Red Army colonel named Vladimir Gil is awarded the Order of the Red Star by Joseph Stalin. Back in August, he and his men killed 90 Germans. Nothing to write home about, right? Thousands of Germans are killed every day. So why the big old medal? Well, what if I told you that Colonel Gill and his men had been living and working with the Germans? That they were trained by the Sicherheitsdienst? Too outlandish to be true? Well, my dears, this is the story of Operation Zeppelin. This is Spies and Ties, a series of World War II in real time, and I am Astrid Deinhardt. Hello, darlings. So, what exactly is Operation Zeppelin? Well, it's the product of Walter Schellenberg. He is head of the SD Foreign Intelligence Agency, and we met him, right, back in 1939 when he kidnapped two MI6 agents in the Netherlands. And later, when he went to Switzerland, he had business with our friend Sam Woods. Probably you may remember. The program began back in spring 1942, when Schellenberg suggested recruiting thousands of Soviet POWs to act as spies and saboteurs behind Soviet lines. Vladimir Gill will just be one small part of this, and I'll come back to him later. So, both Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler and the director of the SD Reinhard Heydrich like this idea very much. And not just for the espionage potential, it also satisfies their lust for power. As you may have seen in many of my episodes, the SD is in very hard competition with Admiral Wilhelm Canaris and his Abwehr, the Military Intelligence Service. Heydrich has already been doing his best to undermine Canaris. He's been making the most of the Abwehr's failures and spreading rumors that some of its leading figures are connected to the German resistance. He's not actually wrong on that front, as we know. Now, it's a big win for the SD when Hitler gives his blessing to the Zeppelin program. It allows them to expand onto Canaris turf. First things first, how to convince Soviet POWs to fight for the Germans? Hmm. This shouldn't actually be too difficult. There are already tens of thousands in the Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS. The SD know that they won't get Soviet POWs to simply fight for Germany, so a Zeppelin is framed as a battle against Judeo-Bolshevism, the central tenet of Nazism. After the war, Schellenberg will talk of a noble crusade alongside happy Slavic helpers. He'll talk about how the men wear German uniforms and are fed and housed the same as Wehrmacht men. That they are given guided tours of farms and factories and the Autobahn to demonstrate the superiority of the German way. It's true that these things happen, but the story isn't quite that rosy. Indian Sparty have talked about the horror of German POW camps, right? For many of these men, the choice is join Zeppelin or just starve to death. By summer 1942, recruitment efforts have brought in between 10,000 and 15,000 candidates who are sent to various training camps across Germany and occupied Europe. At the camps, the recruits learn radio drills, sabotage techniques, and propaganda techniques. After medical screening and training, about 3,000 agents are soon ready to go into action. From February 43, these agents are distributed between three Hauptkommando, one of each army group, on the Eastern Front. But Zeppelin quickly falls short of Schellenberg's ambition. 
It's thanks to Germany's much bigger war problem, resources. The Luftwaffe just don't have enough aircraft and fuel to drop all these agents into the Soviet Union. The project has to be scaled down. The SD will never get more than 800 men operating behind enemy lines at any one time. So, there are some very interesting missions though, especially in the Caucasus, where Schellenberg hopes to stir up nationalist feeling to support the German advance during Fallblau. In Chechnya, the SD and the Abwehr work together to support a nationalist insurgency against the Soviets. Between 41 and 43, 50 groups made up of Chechens, Dagestanis and Ossetians and other nationalities are dropped into the Caucasus. It's called Operation Shamil. Two groups are parachuted into the region in September 42. The first goes into Maikop with orders to damage bridges and railways and to prevent the Soviets sabotaging oil production facilities. They join up with the Wehrmacht once it arrives in the city. The second group goes into Grozny, but they are much less successful and a third of them are killed by Soviet forces on landing. They struggle to establish radio communication with their Chechen contacts and when they do meet up with them, the Chechens are suspicious that it's all an NKVD trick. They almost kill the Zeppelin men. In the end, the whole thing comes to naught because the Germans struggle to build an understanding with the nationalists. When they pull out, the Chechens are left high and dry. Meanwhile, Operation Mainz targets Georgia. This is more successful and goes on for much longer. Native Georgian agents infiltrate the region via smuggling routes along the border with Turkey. They head to Batumi and meet up with insurgent nationalists. The nationalists pass on political, economic and military intelligence. In return, the Germans send a steady stream of hmm, weapons. We've already talked about how Turkey maintains decent relations with both sides in the war. Well, Schellenberg travels there in June 43 and convinces Ankara to turn a blind eye. The Turks will allow the mission to continue until August 44. Other groups get even further, going as far east as the Ural Mountains, Kazan and the Volga Delta. One agent gathers intel on Soviet movements by hitching a ride on a troop train to Vladivostok. In Leningrad, a team of Zeppelin men sabotage Finland station. Schellenberg will even claim after the war that one agent infiltrated the staff of General Rokosovsky. So, there are some successes, but failure is far more common. Most Zeppelin agents don't survive long in Soviet territory. Often they are sent in wearing the wrong uniforms or with little local knowledge and countless agents are caught and executed. This happens with five men dropped near the city of Vologda in October 43. Their mission is to scout landing sites for future drops and to interfere with railway traffic. Instead, they are overrun soon after landing. Their radio transmitter is then used by the NKVD to send false intelligence back to the Germans. For many, the problems start before they even go into the field. Without adequate Luftwaffe support, there are hundreds of Zeppelin men waiting for deployment with nothing to do. Some men leak information to Soviet agents who have infiltrated their ranks or get cold feet and switch sides as soon as they are deployed into the USSR. It's little surprise that the men are so willing to turn. I mean, by the summer of 43, the Germans are on the back foot. 
Zeppelin men have to make a horrible decision, stay with the Germans and risk being caught as a spy or take their chances and defect back to Uncle Joe. And it's not like the Germans are winning hearts and minds. Hundreds of men who fail training or develop medical problems are sent to death camps. Even those who return from successful missions aren't safe. The SD are paranoid that they might have been turned by the Soviets and Schellenberg himself signs off on several executions. That's another thing he will leave out of his post-war memoirs. And now we come to Vladimir Gil. He defected to the Germans back in 41 and is now commanding the Druzhina Brigade for the Waffen-SS, a Russian nationalist force of about 2,000 to 2,500 men. It's not part of Operation Zeppelin itself, but by summer 43, 500 to 800 Zeppelin men have been mixed into Druzhina because the SD don't have the resources to deploy them all into the USSR. The mixed Druzhina and Zeppelin force finds itself carrying out anti-partisan duties in the rear, in Belarus. This is not what they expected. Surprisingly enough, these Russian nationalists aren't too happy about killing the very people they want to be saving from Bolshevism. Since July, Gil has been in contact with Soviet intelligence. He's received assurance that he can switch sides back to the Red Army without punishment. So, in August 43, he does just that. And as I said, he and his men kill 90 Germans and then join the partisans. And one month later, he gets his medal from Stalin. Zeppelin has just trained up a whole bunch of enemy partisans, but the program continues. It includes a pretty partial assassination attempt against Joseph Stalin. Listen up. That won't happen until September 44, but I have to mention it quickly. It's just so ridiculous. Schellenberg will send a former Red Army officer and his wife to Moscow, armed with magnetic mines and a Panzerknacker, a concealed armor-piercing weapon. Hmm? They will be dropped off by aeroplane in Smolensk and set off to Moscow in a motorcycle and sidecar. It almost sounds like something from a World War II comedy film, riding along in a sidecar to kill Stalin. Anyway, the NKVD will have found out all about the plot from their sources within Zeppelin. As soon as the plane lands, the NKVD begin hunting the would-be assassins down. They will be captured at the checkpoint, thrown into jail and, of course, executed. So, Zeppelin was probably doomed from the start. It sort of sums up the mess that is German intelligence. It's poorly planned and resourced, blinded by ideology and held back by squabbling between the different services. But let's remember, history doesn't happen in a vacuum. I love saying that. The whole thing is still very useful for Schellenberg because it has helped the SD botch into the obvious realm of military intelligence. We know that Canaris is working with the resistance and Hitler doesn't think highly of him at all. But as Canaris' staff falls, it seems that Walter Schellenberg's is rising and rising fast. I'm sure this isn't the last that we'll see of him. So you better stay tuned to Spies and Ties. To get ever more content like this, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. If you'd like to learn more about the SD's rivals, the Abwehr, click here for my video on Admiral Canaris and his men. 
I'll see you next time, darlings. Hello, I'm back. <laughs> I forgot to say something yesterday. Um, we did a Time Goes fan meeting in Normandy and in Munich, and one of our very, very sweet brigadiers, Mark Steenbeck, came even to, say, uh, to stay in the tea house with us. His uh, girlfriend, Fleur, is also a brigadier. Unfortunately, she got very ill, and um, I promised him to use my power of media <laughs> to send out all the best wishes for her. Keep it up. I wish you all the best and have a wonderful time with Mark. He is the sweetest guy ever. We went to the Oktoberfest and we had a lovely stay here in the tea house. And I wish you both all the best. Fleur and Mark. Thank <sniffs> you.